Today we got Shannon Alberts with Security Loop Key Roofing, 920 Roofing. That's 920roofing.com. We're easy stuff. to reach at 920 Roofing. Reach. I love it. So yeah, so Shannon, tell us a little bit about Security Loop Key. Introduce what you guys do for the greater Green Bay, Fox Valley, Northeast Wisconsin area. Yeah. And then we'll dive into kind of your story. We're a residential and commercial roofing contractor that does all the other things associated with roofing, like gutters and insulation and stuff. We service all of Northeast Wisconsin. The company was founded in 1934 and has gone through different ownership. For those of you listening, Shannon's not over 100 years I'm old. I'm not. I've been with the company for 20 years. So I was hired in 2003. Um, I started as an installer and then I moved into sales and then had an opportunity to purchase the business. We'll talk about that more later. And for the last 10 years, I've been the owner. And for the last six years, I've been the president. We, it, it was pretty steady at two, three, four million dollars a year for the early 2000s. And then in 2013, when I bought it, it was a four, just about four million dollars. And this year we're gonna do almost 50. Wow. So in 10 years time, it's gone from three to 4 million to some growth. Yeah. 10, 12, 13X. That's awesome. So take us back first, like your kind of early days of, okay, I'm, I'm been here for a while and now I get to be an owner. What was that transition like for you? Wild. It was, uh, it was learning a lot of learning. I went to school, but not for business. Right. Sure. So, I think when the, I think to answer that, you have to understand the circumstances that kind of put me at an ownership table. Right? Yeah. So I had just finished one of my best years in sales and thought the company was great, thought my future was great. Uh, my family and I had our house in the market. We we're about to upgrade. So things were great. And then one day we were told the business was about to go bankrupt. So <laughs> un unbeknownst to a lot of people. And we saw an opportunity, me and a few other employees, and we purchased the assets of the business and kept it going. And we immediately, it was drinking from a fire hose because yeah. none of us had business. So we we're like, okay, what, who's going to be in charge of what? So I settled on the sales and marketing part because I was coming out of the sales force and sure. had some experience in that. Plus, as an employee, I saw being a sales rep, I saw the impact the company had. I saw the brand that it had when you sit down with somebody at their kitchen table talking about buying a roof and they're like, oh, we love you guys. You guys are great. You've been around forever. So I knew the brand was excellent, Yeah, which made it really exciting to purchase because I know when you start a business, building that brand is the hardest thing to do. Right. No one knows you. Right? Mm -hmm. We were buying a business that already had clients. It already had the phone ringing automatically. So I'm like, that's great. Mm -hmm. But I also knew there was a lot of room for improvement, mm -hmm. right? which is evidenced by the fact it was going bankrupt. Going bankrupt yeah. yeah. So I knew there was a lot of room for improvement, especially in the marketing side, on the sales side, definitely in some internal processes. And that became our focus. <laughs> after the first year, one of the owners exited. After the second year, a different owner exited. The third year, the last owner exited. And it was just and it was me. All the chips. Yeah. And then at that time, we had gone from three to six to nine million. So it was going really well and we were outgrowing our space. We were renting a place right off the highway in Kakana. Okay. Because we had to get there. When we bought the business, we had to get out of the building we were in. Oh, sure. So we had to find a place and it fit us. We had 20 employees. We had 20 employees and 20 trucks. And we're like, it, we fit there. Mm -hmm. But then by the time we left there, we were at almost 60 employees and 40 trucks, right? So oh. we had outgrown our, our space. And how so, many are you at now? I always use trucks and people as a measurement of growth, which is weird. <laughs> yeah. But if you're from Northeast Wisconsin, you see our trucks, yeah. right? We're currently at about 95 trucks and 125 employees. Wow. Yeah. And that doesn't include our partners. We use some different installation crews for some of our projects. Oh, sure. Right? So we have more people than just that. Yeah. But there's 125 on the payroll. Wow. Yeah. That's a big number change yeah. from 20. So it was 2018. And we needed to get out of that space. The city of Appleton had this spot open. So I bought the land and we built a building. And now... You got enough space? Uh, 
there's been times <laughs> where, where I feel like we're breaking at the seams, but th those are always temporary. The business is very seasonal. Yeah. As you can imagine. Yeah. The sales go in sales cycles. The labor goes in a labor cycle, right? Mm -hmm. um, we think of spring and fall are big pushes for sales. Mm -hmm. People don't tend to think about replacing their roof in the winter mm -hmm. unless there's a big problem, right? right? And we find actually a lull in the summertime. Kids are off of school, families are on vacation, so we dip a little bit in the summer too. But spring and fall are big for sales. And then labor, labor peaks in the summer because you have long days, the temperature is great, and then it tapers off right around now going into December. And then depending on how well winter cooperates, we stay pretty busy. Would you say you hire seasonal workers at all? None. No? Wow. None. The only seasonal employees that we've dabbled with were college students. Yeah. And they're filling in more like assistant roles. Definitely no field workers really. Okay. But like admin roles. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Usually it's an employee who has a kid who's back from college yeah. and they want to find something for him to do. And I'm like, ah, we'll find something for him to do. Nice. So that works. So what are some of the, the biggest changes you would say you've made? Obviously the phone kept ringing and you kept the place in business, but or some of those obstacles or things that you really changed that weren't in place before that you attribute really to your success, like one or two of those big things that in a decade that happened? The tangible ones are easy. It was more the intangible ones for, for me personally. Mm -hmm. I got to the point where... I knew I wasn't the smartest person in the room. I knew there were things I needed help with and I needed to just stay humble and stay open and always surround myself with people who were experts. So even when I was the last person in charge, I still kept people around me and keep close relationships. Like when I first bought the business, I had no idea what a P&L was. Sure. I had no idea what a balance sheet was, <laughs> right. literally. But then after spending hours and days and years with our CPA, our banker, our corporate attorney, our insurance agent, guys who would just sit down and they would explain it all to me over and over. I still talk to my banker every month. I still talk to my CPA every month. And I always encourage them to hold me accountable. I'm like, tell me what, ask me questions. And I remember they used to ask me questions that I had no idea. And then I'd have to find out. And then I would say, oh, this is what leads to that. And now they ask me questions and they're softballs because yeah. I got it now. So I really feel like I got like a business degree, really, but like trial by fire, as my being dad, on the front line. As my dad would say, that's the school of hard knocks degree. That's yes, exactly HK. what it was. Yeah. Absolutely. That's, so that was something that I had to keep in the forefront and I still do now. I don't ever think that I got it all figured out. So I'm, I have a lot of people that I surround myself with that I ask to help hold me accountable. Perfect. Yeah. The tangible ones, we went from... 9 million to 15 million by adding a proven sales process. By saying, we got three, four, six reps out in the field and they're all doing their own thing and they're fine it's, and, and, and we're being successful, but we don't have a, we don't have a process. Yeah. So we spent a couple years really cementing and training and enforcing a sales process, which actually resulted in some turnover of sure. some sales reps. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Because they're like, why are you telling me I got to do this different? I'm like, yeah. because I have to teach other people how to do this. And I can and teach them and their way and then their way. Exactly. Yeah. So you yeah. get it. So the proven repeatable sales process was a big one. That was awesome. And then, are you familiar with EOS? Okay. It's based off the Traction book. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's so. Gina Wickman. And, Gina Wickman. Yeah. yeah. And uh, once I added that about five years ago, that was big because I knew that I needed the business to not depend on me Yeah. because I was wearing a lot of hats, especially early on. I remember, I, I distinctly remember every single hat that I've taken off. I remember saying, okay, I can't be in charge of marketing anymore. I need a marketing person mm -hmm. and that's hard. Mm -hmm. I can't be in charge of IT. I can't be in charge of all the things that I was the most qualified to do based on the people in the room. And sometimes that means we got to go find somebody to do that thing. Right. And then I just built a, a leadership team and now my, the, the draws on my time are a lot less. My stress is a ton less. Now, yeah, it means I have to 
it means I have to pay them. It means I have to reward yeah, them, yeah. right? It means I have to coach them. But when you find the right people, that makes all that easy. I remember the, one of the things that, that really spearheaded that thought for me was I was looking at a business acquisition for another roofing company f- from the area. Have you had any acquisitions? Some small ones. Okay. But I was looking at that one, and I remember looking at it. I was looking at it with my business advisor. Oh, actually, CPA, lawyer, attorney, all those people that helped me. I also have made a really close friend to the business professor at Lawrence University. Oh, nice. Yeah. And I pay him to meet with me. I pay him to meet with different members of my team, depending on what I want them to learn. And I remember looking at this at the P&L and the balance sheet from another business for the first time, looking at it and being able to see issues that I would have not ever been able to see before. Yeah. And then I remember talking with him about it and he said, the owner's leaving, his wife is leaving, his son is leaving. So you're losing all the brain power behind that business. So once it leaves, what's it worth? Yeah. It's worth a few trucks. It's worth a a little book of business. Goodwill. A brand that's not even close to ours. So what are you buying? Mm -hmm. Nothing. Phone number? Nothing. Exactly. (laughs) And it wasn't as cool as 920 Roofing. Yeah, I (laughs) know. And then I realized I'm going to be what limits the value of the business. So I started intentionally making myself as irrelevant as possible. Yep. It sounds weird to say, but that's what I did. Reminds me of the book, Replaceable Founder. Yeah. Yeah. I had to make it, and I have now, so I can leave. Yep. And now I get to travel, and I'm really fortunate, and I still work with my team. I get my updates, and if it's on fire, they call me, and if they see that it's an area of my expertise, they'll absolutely loop me in. Who is the guy from Virgin? Oh, Russell Brand. Richard Branson. Oh, Branson. Branson. Yeah. A bunch of his quotes have always rung true for me, especially when I was early. Like, when I first bought the business, I got real, like, I wasn't a big reader, I became a big reader. Yeah. Read a bunch of really good books that really helped me. And his was awesome. And a bunch of his quotes stuck with me. And one of them was, and I quote this probably once a month with somebody in this building. I say, or he said, I never fired anybody for making a bad decision, but I fired a lot of people for not making decisions. So I really used that to empower that's my great. team. And I say, if you can't, if you don't have time to bounce it off me, that's fine. Make a decision. You're in this position because I trust you. I feel like these are conversations I just had over and over again for the last five years. And over time... So you're building this culture of understanding. You own and, it. And you own, the, yeah. you own your role. Yeah. yeah. I started to Empowering do, your team. I started to do this gesture with people where I was like handing them the car keys. Oh, yeah. Because they, they come to me, they'd be like, here's the problem and we could do this or this. And I'm like, you're asking me, but this is your area. So you do what you got to do. Yeah. And we'll see what happens. And if it flops, we'll talk about it. We'll all learn and we'll go somewhere else. As long as somebody's not falling off a roof or whatever, (laughs) we're fine. Yeah. No trucks are on fire. Exactly. So, yeah. So EOS was a big one because it gave me the ability to build a framework or a structure for my business. Mm -hmm. And now I can leave for one, two weeks at a time. I've left this building alone for a month at a time. And And it's totally fine. Still standing. And it's totally fine. And honestly, it's probably better. (laughs) Right. Right? Yeah. They know that I'm there. Like, they like it when I'm here. They like it when my door's open and I'm sitting at my desk and they can come in and be like, hey. They also like it when I'm not here because they know that they're empowered. Mm -hmm. They know I'm always reachable if they need me. And I've really built a really great team. There's people on our team that were in the same position I was. They weren't qualified to hold the role that they're in now. But now they are because they did the same thing that I did. Right? Yeah. It was, what would you call it? Trial by fire or yeah, yeah. what did you say? School of Hard Knocks. School of Hard Knocks. I've put a lot of people in this building through the School of Hard Knocks. That's good. And they're That's great. A great teacher. Yeah. So what does the next, call it five, ten years look like for you? I hate that question. I know you would. The funny, but you probably thought about it. I think about it. When I run out of other things to think about, it, that's what, what I think, think about. Of that? Uh, on a professional level here, that's the crazy part because I started by telling you I started to invest in this business differently when I thought about me holding back its value. If it's worth X with me here, but I leave and it's worth half X, right. I'm the problem. Yep. So the funny thing is making those decisions has built a really good business, but it's also providing me an incredible amount of joy and I can't even imagine selling it. Like I'm not going to. So that's the weird part. And as you can imagine, I'm approached quite a bit and mm-hmm. I've not, I'm not, 
I haven't once entertained more than a two minute conversation with anybody who's wanted to talk about investing or acquiring or purchasing security loop roofing. I, because it's running so well, I'm 46 years old. I was gonna say, uh, you're not, not even 50 yet. Yeah, and I'm not so old that I'm annoying the people who are here. Yeah. I'm fine, <laughs> they're not like, oh, crazy dad's back, Yeah. you know? No, <laughs> Would he, would he retire yet? No, I don't think we're there at all. And I don't see that for, I don't see far enough down to see where that is. So I think the next five years is just to continue to do this. I told you I was shooting some video this morning and it was about our charitable giving. So it's just on the top of my mind. But for the first time ever, we were able to give back over $400,000 this year to our community. Where does where is some of that going? Like, What are you impacting in the community that's been important? I categorize it by very small and intimate stuff and then very local. It's like in the Bible, it talks about your Bethlehem and then Jerusalem and then to the ends of the earth. Yeah. So I think about it. I want to make sure that I'm doing stuff that's small and impactful, but then go a little bit bigger. Like, what can we do to help Appleton? What can we do to help Green Bay? And then what can we do to help go all the way to the end? What can, what can we do to help make the world better? Mm -hmm. And this year we gave away a bunch of free roofs wow. because you meet somebody. We did a couple for some veterans. We do uh, Habitat for Humanity, stuff like that, where you're impacting the life of a family. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. We've also been huge supporters of the Hope Clinic, which is a hospital in Appleton for the under and uninsured. So that's been great. We've been doing that for six or eight years now, and they see thousands of patients yeah. that they wouldn't be able to without our support. So now I'm getting a little bit bigger, right? Yeah. Now, yeah. And then this year we did a significant contribution to Freydert for breast cancer research. Wow. Because I did not understand how many of our employees were actually affected by breast cancer. It's amazing how many. So I wanted to do some sort of a charitable, I wanted to do a big cancer push this year. I wanted okay. to do something to give back to improve something big, something bigger than just Northeast Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And after, after talking with a bunch of our employees, breast cancer was right up there. Like employees, spouses of employees, parents, brothers and sisters, aunts, uncles, almost everybody has somebody. Yep. So that became our passion. We knocked that out of the park this year. Cool. So that was really fun and it's rewarding. So. Yeah, that's excellent. Growth for the future, right? No, no plans on winding down. No, that funny thing is we talked, we just had our company meeting. We do an annual company meeting. It's when people get their Christmas, Christmas bonuses. Christmas stuff and all that, and yeah. We do a year in review. I've always been very transparent as an owner. We have a, I have a roofer who has worked here for eight months. I honestly didn't know his name. And I hate to say that, but we're to that point mm -hmm. where you have to work here for a little bit or something really bad have to happen <laughs> for, me to, for me to know who you are, right? Yeah. But he came up to me after that meeting and he shook my hand and he said, I have worked for other roofing companies. And I just want you to know, none of them have ever been this generous. None of them have been this transparent. None of them have made me feel this appreciated as a guy who's out there putting shingles on a roof. That made my, that, that was it for me. I got goosebumps right now so you got just from that. So I feel like that always, that's always reaffirming mm -hmm. that I'm, so I wanna to continue to do that. But it's in that meeting where we talk about what was our goal this year? How did we do? What's our goal next year? And it's funny because we have had steady growth every year, somewhere between 15 and 30% every year. And there's been employees who have been like, you should stop growing, right? We're getting too big. Stop trying to grow. And the story always is we're not trying to grow. We don't ever sit down, write our budget, make our plan and say, we have to add 10% this year. We never, we, keep sharpening everything up Things before you right know it, way. the car is going faster yeah. and faster and faster. Yeah. And we're not doing it on purpose, but it starts with having a good brand and doing good marketing. Oh my gosh, the phone's ringing. Okay. Now we have to sell really effectively. Wow. We're selling really effectively. Look how much work we have. Great. We need more trucks and more people. Now yep. we need more training. Now we need overhead. Yep. Now we need all these other processes. Yep. Oh my gosh, we're doing a really good job. Guess what that does? It makes the phone ring more. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not intentional. We're not intentionally not, but we're also not intentionally doing it. Right. which I think is what's cool. And I can't imagine not being here to watch what the next five years look, looks like. We have some- it's exciting. We have, yeah, we have some other things we want to get better at, 
But if we're sitting here five years from now and we have 10% more employees, which I always get excited about that because those are families, right? Those yeah, are people who's, yeah, those, right. yeah. I like to think that I do a pretty good job as a boss. So I, I want everybody to work for me yeah. because I want you to have a great, I want you to feel appreciated. I want you to have life-changing wages, right? I want you to be excited to come to work and a little bit sore when you get home at night. I, I think that's at least for five more years, right? Yeah. But then I also don't ever see me selling this to anybody who's not in this building. In this building. Yeah. It protects that, the legacy of the, the brand. and Absolutely. Yeah. Even Agreed. if it results in me making less, I'm fine. Yeah. I'd, yeah. Rather, it, I'd rather it transition to somebody who gets this culture. Because I know what happens when you, you ask if I bought other if i had any other mergers yeah they were small but i can't imagine somebody buying it and then being like okay here's how we're going to do things now yeah. i believe there would be a huge mutiny yeah change everything up yeah. yeah so what would you in the few last minutes here what would you say to younger or i would say younger entrepreneurs maybe don't have 20 years in but maybe are in their fifth through 10th year into the business that they're you probably hit on a few of them already but maybe just to reiterate some of the lessons that you learned and that you could pass on to a younger Shannon if you could go back in time now. Oh my gosh, there's a lot. I really enjoy talking to business owners who struggle with having partners. I remember how much the world changed when I became the majority owner and then shortly thereafter, the only, the owner. only owner. I meet businesses who are like, oh, I'm 50-50 with my brother and we're doing... And I'm like, oh, that sounds like a nightmare, right? Because <laughs> you have to get along forever. Yeah. And you don't. Yeah. I'm in charge of sales. He's in charge of operations. I'm like, oh, you guys have to be fighting constantly. Yeah. <laughs> right? So I really love the owner business dynamic. And I, I thought about doing something outside of here and getting into some business development that could be in the works in the next five years. As my time, as my time constraints here are less and less, but I still have a passion if you haven't figured it out in the last 20 minutes about this stuff, I would love to, I would maybe love to just get into maybe some freelance and just help a few people yeah. here and there, help them navigate through whatever their problem. I love meeting somebody for the first time. This just happened to me in the Atlanta airport. Sat down with a guy, business owner. After we exchanged pleasantries, I just said, so what's driving you crazy right now? What's your problem right now? And I don't have all the answers, but I love talking about it. Yeah. And I have a handful of answers, or at least I have a handful of suggestions. So that's fun. What was the question you asked me? <laughs> Entrepreneurs, what advice would you give a young Shannon or other folks who are five or six years Stay old? humble. Appreciate all the help that you get. Listen more than you talk. Oh, that took me a long time to learn. That's probably it. I meet very young and confident and cocky people who have tasted a little bit of success. Calming that down a little bit can lead to so much more, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. right? I, I know a guy who just sold his roofing business right here in our backyard. And I know, what, I, I know the work he put into it, and I know he sold it, and I know he's happy about what he made on it, and it's great, his family's gonna be fine. He could have done so much better. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I don't know how that translates, but. No, it's good. I it's think staying good. humble is easy because you meet a lot of business owners who, especially, maybe it's just construction, but they get real puffy, right? Yeah. They're like, look yeah. what I did. I'm like, yeah. you didn't do shit. All these people did. I say, I built a million dollars. Yeah. Two million dollars yeah. worth of homes yeah. this year. Exactly. Forgot. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a lot of the Richard Branson stuff, right? Like, mind the small expenses. I remember going through those phases where I was like, where is everything going? Yeah. I don't know. You're going to have me thinking about that question long after you leave here, though. That's okay. Yeah. That's okay. That's cool. I think what you said, though, and it's been echoed by other business owners, is surround yourself with people who are smarter than you. Absolutely. And listen to them. Yeah. And not be afraid to keep learning. And the other element that you added was lean into the business, not focus so much on growth, but focus on the things that you can get right. Like you said, like changing the sales process and having other people do things that you weren't particularly the best at so that they could be the best at it and you can be the best at what you can be best at, if that makes sense. I'm not a baseball fan, but it, if you build it, they will come, I think is a baseball reference, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, Field of Dreams. Field of Dreams. Yeah. So I think that, don't worry about that. Don't say, oh, I want a 10X. That, that's not the goal. The goal is how do we fix these things? That's why I always say when I meet somebody, what's driving you crazy? Because there's usually one thing that they can't get over. Mm -hmm. And then when you do that, a bunch of things happen. And then mm -hmm. before you know it, you're there. Oh, one of the last books I read was The Gap and the Gain. Yeah. Yeah. 
That was a good one. We focus on how we didn't get there, yep. but you don't realize that you're this much closer. All the gain you made yeah. behind you. Yep. Yeah. That was good. Love to share you. Love to share audible list with you of all the books because <laughs> you read a lot of similar ones. So that's awesome. So Shannon, any last parting words for our YouTube viewers or podcast listeners today? I love talking about this stuff. As you saw, if somebody is just, hey, we'd like to talk to you about this, I'm always game. It was good to hear your story, Shannon, and, and congrats to really turning Security Loop Geography into an awesome place to, sounds like, to work and to also impact our community in a positive way. Well, that wraps up today's episode of From Garage to Growth, a small business success story. Appreciate you all, and tune in next time.